on this particular watercolor, I'm going to seem like I'm contradicting myself at the beginning because I will say when you look at the final painting, you'll see that it's got lots of spatters, lots of broken color. And I always talk about that I don't begin a painting that way. You always start with your big, broad uh, individual statements, individual shapes first, the biggest shapes and values you can get away with and then break it down to its smaller parts. But I also will spatter a watercolor painting normally at the beginning just to to loosen up just to not get real uptight but you'll see that very quickly I begin to pull all that together in large fields of color in this particular instance it wasn't important to me to distinguish any one big shape at the uh, any individual shapes I actually wanted to tone the whole surface and so what I did was I did some spatters runnels uh, big washes that would flow into each other and sort of bluish where the water was going to be greenish where some foliage was going to be maybe reddish pinks where uh, some dirt would be that way those colors would shine through later and uh, present themselves in the final painting but also the way they would bleed into one another at the beginning it kept everything from being a patchwork quilt we've got our water section we've got our uh, tree section here we've got our bank section here we've got our other bank section here and we draw it with lines and then we stay within the lines well that can make for a very stiff painting so instead by allowing these washes to flow into one another you get an immediate smooth transition from one object that will be delineated at, in the end so from one object to the next there's a natural transition because there's a bleed of one color into the other once that's established then you can come in and start uh, delineating different areas uh, different shapes however you want to now this is a more broken up a little bit harder to read painting than you, you if you're used to looking at my work or seeing how I work uh, this is a little bit different uh, and again a lot of it is because I'm still I haven't committed myself to any of the big shapes yet I, I'm still working in fields of, of, of shapes fields of color so that one area is blending into another it's using these washes to make tr smooth transitions and I know it can seem a little contradictory but I hope you can understand that I'm trying to keep in mind the whole time that eventually when I do start breaking down into more specific shapes that I've already established certain areas that um, will have a certain color signature and a certain boundary but it's it's smooth and amorphous right now but then once I start putting it in then it uh, each one begins to delineate itself quite nicely I'll put in the shadow on the bank that goes into the water and that um, that now begins to break 
the left side of the painting into what will eventually be the bank and the water. Um, but I don't have a line. I've just got a uh, softer or a little bit harder transition that's delineating the separation between the bank and the water than I had earlier. As I put in the trees, again, they're big shapes. They're as big a shapes as I can get away with. So a trunk is one silhouette of a trunk. Then I'll go in maybe and drop some other colors into it. But the trunks of those trees are are not painted with three different or four or five different values at first. No, it's one value that states the silhouette. That's my big shape of the tree, tree trunk. Then I come in uh, as it's still wet and drop some colors in. Later, I might come in and uh, put in a shadow or an accent highlight or something like that. But uh, I'm, I'm still working even at this point with silhouettes. Now later when I start delineating the foliage, I have to really concentrate because it can be confusing. You get these woodsy landscapes where it's just foliage everywhere it gets real easy to become confused and you don't know where one thing starts and another thing ends and what I can tell you is when you're working on something like that the value of squinting cannot be over uh, overstated by squinting you get rid of color and you get rid of value and you begin to meld things into real simple shapes. And that's what will allow you to pick out an individual clump of leaves on a tree from other clumps of leaves on other trees or whole trees that are in the background. Because hopefully they will begin to distinguish themselves as large silhouette shapes and that's where you'll go in and try your best to see well especially in the background can I merge three or four clumps of tree um, leaves together and make a shape which might be broken down into a sub subsections later or can I just leave it alone is it really important that those masses of leaves on those three trees be distinguished as three different masses or does it read better as one large mass probably especially if it's in the background it's going to be read better in the as one mass because that will then give you a large area, a large section where the trees that are closer, the clumps of leaves that are nearer to you, those can be delineated as a separate color and a separate value. Now you really only have about eight or nine values you can see really. And if you've got six of them in the background then you've only got a couple of values that you can delineate what's in front of you and so that's where your mid-tone or your, your light middle and dark values will get muddled and lost because you can't tell where they're at you'll have light tones in the distance and dark tones up close and then dark tones in the distance and light clones tones up close and it just Visually, you can't tell who's closer, who's further away. So it's a, it's a good idea to do as much uh, what's called value grouping as you possibly can so that you don't, you don't run the risk 
of merging things together in such a way that not only can your viewer not tell what's going on, you can't even tell what's going on. Uh, a little bit later in the painting, I begin to bring out my casings and gouache, and I begin to pick out highlights. I begin to pick out mid-tones and light tones from the darks. And I begin to push some of the darks back even further. Uh, and it's, it's just a, a process. It's just a slow building process of putting in some lights, seeing if you, if, if you, that's how you want it. If you like it, fine. If you don't, you darken it back down. Or you put the lights in, realize you can't go any lighter. So you've got to darken what's around it down so that your lights will come up. And when you're doing something like this, don't be afraid to change your colors. It's real easy to get stuck on, well, I'm just going to use yellow and green for the foliage and forget that even if it's not a fall foliage time of year that there's still all sorts of wonderful pinks and purples and mauves and uh, blues and oranges in, in in those leaves even even if it at first blush doesn't appear so the longer you look the more you'll start seeing them. And even if they're not there, so what? If we want an exact photographic likeness, well, take a photograph. But if you want to have a painting that's going to reflect your particular take on this subject, then that gives you the license to take your your knowledge of color theory and begin to put in colors that work for your painting. Now I'm not talking about grabbing pink because you're feeling in a pink mood and just slashing them down there at random. What I'm talking about is thinking in terms of okay well red is the complement of green and so pink by virtue of the fact that it's got red in it is going to be complementary to your greens so if you're really trying to make your greens stand out well, maybe throw some pink in there or maybe mix some pink in there uh, you've done that for a while that's starting to get a little overwhelming you got green and pink well what else could we do if we still want to stick with that sort of complementary feel you could go to orange why orange because orange has red in it which is the complement of green and by the same token you could take mauve or purple or grapele or anything like that and do the same thing and again why does that work because mauve and purple and grapele all have red in them so that begins to help you make sense of why would you how are you going to bring these other colors out how are you going to have variety in your colors it's a thinking process it's knowing and understanding what um, what colors work together which ones don't or in your particular instance during that particular painting don't work together. Um, I can't emphasize enough the importance of learning color theory. And, and it doesn't have to be incredibly complex, but the more you know, the better off you are. So that if you can sit down and, and analyze and go, well, do I want it to be analogous, triadic, complementary, split complementary do I want to use um, 
a color gamut where you know you you take a certain segment of the color wheel and uh, I won't get all into it but you can look up gamut painting and uh, you, you take a certain section and those are the colors that you use and you don't use anything else by playing experimenting with that it gives you such a tremendous uh, amount of tools at your disposal that you can use to make just wonderful color combinations that you would never have thought of on your own and certainly you wouldn't have come up with if you were just sort of quote feeling your painting or feeling the colors and forgive me I mean if I'm stepping on toes well you know wear steel toed boots what can I tell you um, I don't have a lot of uh, use or sympathy for people who try to overly mysticize a lot of this um, can painting be magical and all yeah but when you're talking about technique and like in my case where I'm actually trying to teach you how to do something then getting all airy fairy and mystical it doesn't help you uh, it may make the teacher sound you know sort of uh, in the stratosphere and otherworldly and really deep but it's not. They, they've either hit on something that they're just not willing to share with you or they're just lucky and they're doing something and they don't even realize what they're doing. But for me, uh, when I'm teaching, I'm trying to show how you can achieve those effects by using the tools that are available to you. And believe me, there is nothing, absolutely nothing, that any painter, any sculptor, any artist that you admire, there's nothing that they're doing that you can't do, at least in theory. Because all they're doing is taking tools, which are, in our case, brushes, palette knives, whatever, and pigment, and then putting that pigment onto a substrate, whether it be paper, a concrete wall, canvas, whatever it is, there's nothing mystical or magical about it. You're taking solid concrete objects and or, or substances like paint and putting it onto a concrete object like a piece of paper. Now if that's what you're doing, that can then be broken down into an understandable technique that you can use to create any effect anyone can possibly do. Now before I let you go, I will say as you watch this, you may have noticed that at times the whole color of the thing just shifts and does something weird. Um, that was my camera doing some weird stuff. I've hopefully fixed that and that's not going to happen. I tried to fix it a little bit in post here, but it just got to be too too onerous a, ta a, a, a task. Um, I'm not creating the uh, you know the Ten Commandments by Cecil B. DeMille. I'm, I'm just doing a, a, a demonstration video so uh, sometimes you have to live with little quirks of, of, of the medium and in this instance I was getting some shifts with the, the uh, color range on my uh, or the color meter or something like that in the camera and so it was shifting everything around so it's not your eyes and I'm aware that it happened and uh, I've hopefully fixed that and won't let that happen again well, I appreciate you watching. Uh, don't forget to click and subscribe. And uh, thank you till next time.
If you've enjoyed this episode of The Arthropologist, please hit the like button. And if you'd like to see more episodes like this, think about subscribing. I'm Bill Wilson, and I'm The Arthropologist.